Um, I mean, every Sunday I feel inadequate, but this is one of those messages where I feel really, really inadequate. Two reasons. Um, I told Carrie that this is a week where I can't remember having a week where I have had a greater leap forward in my understanding of spiritual things. Maybe I've had one in my life, or more than one, but this week has just been, my mind has just been blown because of how I've more, I don't know, I don't know if it's deeply or whatever, but, but in, in a better way understood God. And that happened because I'm thinking about how women reveal God to us. So, um, you know, when that happens, when I have this great leap forward, um, I find that so often I'm not able to translate that for everybody else. So maybe by the grace of a bit of a leap forward as well. I guess we lost our kids. Um, what is this from the? Is this from the movie The Deplorables? Oh, this is. This. <laughs> Close. No. Um, it's. <laughs> No, it's despicable me, isn't it? All right, the minions. If a woman speaks and no one is listening, her name is probably mom. (laughs) I love this one. My daughter wanted a Cinderella-themed party, so I invited all her friends over and made them clean the house. (laughs) This is a good one, Scott. Um, A cop pulled me over and said, papers. I said, scissors, I win, and drove off. (laughs) Oh, that, that looks like a police chase ensuing, doesn't it? <laughs> um, that's great. Well, Mom, the master of minions. There is a nobility in compassion. Aren't moms great at compassion? There is a nobility in compassion, a beauty in empathy, and a grace in forgiveness. Here's the takeaway. Moms practically reveal the softer side of God. You'll have to forgive me because, yes, I've been shopping at Sears. We needed a new dishwasher. But moms, I think, do practically reveal, in a very practical way, up close and personal, with intimacy, Moms reveal the softer side of God. I don't even remember how I got there, but I got to Psalm 25. So if you'd like to turn a Bible to Psalm 25, uh, let me encourage you to do that. I think verse 10 wraps up the message of the psalm. It'd be kind of easy just to zip past it. But it says, all the paths of Yahweh, all the paths of Yahweh are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his decrees. All the paths of Yahweh the name of God, are loving kindness and truth. That brought me to some really simple, basic truths, facts about God. You can call this theology if you want to. You don't need to call it theology. It's just some pretty simple stuff. Sometimes the most simple stuff is the most powerful, isn't it? I've already talked about this. Everything that exists, there are two categories. In one box, there's everything else, creation. And outside that box, God's box is infinite and eternal. So I didn't have space on the screen to put... Well, there aren't really boundaries of God's box, right? So there's God who's outside of the box of creation. So what exists? God and everything else. Let me tell you, the most important spiritual concept of all is that there is a God who is separate from, completely other than creation. 
That is so foundational and so important. You might think there's not a God, and that takes you in all kinds of different directions, but you might think that God and creation are uh, too connected. Now, the Egyptians, during the time of the Israeli slavery, back in the days of Moses, um, they thought God was what? The sun, Pharaoh even. And, and you can see in so many societies how um, creation and God are um, falsely mingled together. If you want to get sophisticated about it, there's pantheism, where everything is God and God is in everything. And then there's even more um, sophisticated, there's panentheism, that things aren't God, but God is in everything. And, and Romans 1 says that um, people um, err when they worship the creation instead of the creator, right? So maybe this is the second. The first most fundamental truth is there's a God. Remember, there's a God and it is not me. Um, there's a God, but following right after that is that, that God and creation are completely separate in their being. After that, I think that the, one, of the, one of the most uh, classic ways of describing God um, talks about his categories or his attributes in these two categories. We've talked about this. Remember, um, God, just like us, God is a, uh, a whole being. And to understand God, we have to kind of to look at just parts. We can't really understand the whole all together at once. It blows our mind. So we kind of look at parts of God. As we look at parts of God, um, we can't think of God as just a collection of a bunch of parts. God is one whole unified being. But as we understand God, there is a side of God uh, that we can call the greatness of God. And that includes truth. And that's where you find the justice of God. That's where you find um, the... Uh, righteousness of God, attributes like that. And the other side of God, this is what I'm calling the softer side of God, uh, is the goodness of God. Loving kindness, grace, forgiveness, mercy. I don't know if I can talk like this. If I disappear in a puff of smoke, you'll know not to, do, not to go this direction. My favorite side of God is the softer side of God. For how many of you is your favorite side of God the softer side of God? <laughs> Still waiting for the poof. I know. He's not going to even raise his hand. <laughs> okay, I think we're safe. Um, and, and that's how we want to interact with God. I think, I think actually that's where God wants to interact with us. But that other side of God is critically important, too. All the paths of Yahweh are loving kindness, goodness, and truth, greatness. Okay, now you really want your mind to be blown? I don't know if I should have you hold your head so that it doesn't hurt too much, but this is like poof. Right? For me. Remember we talked about the Old Testament that um, slightly emphasizes the greatness of God. And so you have God dwelling in the tabernacle and the temple where he's present, but he keeps humanity a little bit at arm's length. Ready for this? John 1. And the word, the logos, God's logical, isn't he? God said, let there be light, and there was light. So God, the word of God spoke the universe, the creation into being. But that, that word logos in Greek has to do with logic. Where does logic come from? This is what we're talking about right here is the logic of God. And the logic of God is the basis of the logic of the universe. You ever study biology? They told me that means the study of bio, of life, right? The study of bios. Well, why didn't they say it's the logic of life? Isn't that what it is? You study biology, you're studying the logic of life. You study zoology, you're studying the, the logic of zoos. 
or something like that, right? So when you have a ology, you're talking about, I mean, if there wouldn't be science if there weren't logic behind the universe. You understand that? And you understand that modern science was, was created by Christians because they understood that God created the universe with the logic behind it because God's logical. So we're talking about the logic of God. The logos became flesh and tabernacled, dwelt temporarily, tabernacled, same word, among us. So now in the New Testament, the dwelling place of God is Jesus. He dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father. Now, look at the tabernacle of God for the new covenant. God in the presence of the people, but up close, personal, intimate, not at arm's length. And Jesus left, and now who's the tabernacle of God? The Christian and the church. But check this out. John says, we beheld his glory. We saw the nature of God. And what we saw was that Jesus was full of what? Grace and truth. All the paths of Yahweh are loving kindness and truth. It's just that in the Old Testament, there's a slight emphasis on the truth. And in the New Testament, there's a slight emphasis on the grace. But if you don't keep both in relative balance, you end up with heresy, don't you? There it is, the Old Testament. The Old Testament puts a slight emphasis on the otherness of God. Remember, there's God and there's creation. We need to understand that. We really need to understand that first. First, we need to understand that God is utterly separate from creation. The New Testament puts a slight emphasis on the nearness of God. God is still other than in the New Testament, and he's still near in the Old Testament. But the emphasis has shifted a little bit. So if you want the big $10 word, God is transcendent. He is other than, above, over, sovereign. And God is imminent, close, involved, working in creation. God is just not nearby. He's actively nearby. The first has to do with God's authority. The second has to do with relationship. Now let's check out Genesis. Then God said, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, let us make man in our image. Leaves room for the Trinity there, doesn't it? According to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So here we have man made in the image of God, part of creation, but over creation. Creature, but different from all other creatures. Made in the image of God. Human beings are a revelation of God. You look at a human being, and a human being is the best revelation of God in creation. A human being is the only thing made in the image of God. Verse 27, God created man in his own image, I think he wants to emphasize this. In the image of God, he created him. Get this, male and female, he created them. What does that mean? That means that both men and women are the image of God. But a man, by himself, does not exhaust the image of God. And a woman, by herself, does not exhaust the image of God. This is basic, simple stuff. Am I being too simple for you? But what happens when you put a man and a woman together? Somehow there is the fulfillment of the image of God. Remember, God is a whole. Can you see where this is going? Truth 
and loving kindness, image of God, natural tendency of the male and the female, and how they need to be together. So in Psalm 25, Psalm 25 really, can't help myself, sorry. Psalm 25 um, really does these two things, one after the other. Loving kindness and truth, back and forth. And verse 6 is the focal point of that second. Remember, O Yahweh, your compassion and your loving kindness, for they have been from everlasting. From the very beginning of, of creation, there was God's compassion and his loving kindness. Really, before creation, God was compassionate and had the attribute of love. This word loving kindness is such a great word. We've talked about it. It's the word chesed in Hebrew. It's a strange letter. We don't have it in English. You got to go, right, at the beginning of that. So practice that with me, chesed, right? Ready? Chesed, right? It's a beautiful word. Um, the, the root is connected to the root in Hebrew for stork. And what do storks have a reputation for being? Great mothers. That's why they bring the babies, Right? So um, chesed really is a word that reflects motherly love. How does a mother love her children? How does her, a mother love her babies? It's interesting that, that one of God's qualities is that of motherly love. So we know that God is neither male nor female. There are Feminine imageries of God, especially in the Old Testament. But God always presents himself in the masculine. Hmm. I think I figured that out, too. Here's a woman who is awesome. Brave. She, Heather McDonald, seen her interviewed several times. Just stellar. Right? And why shouldn't she be? BA from Yale University, master's from Cambridge, a law degree from Stanford Law School. Serious stuff. Writes for the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and has written a number of books. And uh, she wrote, I don't know if you get the imprimis from Hillsdale College, but she did a speech and they uh, gave us part of the transcript of that speech. Here's a little bit of the speech. In August 2017, Google fired computer engineer James Damore. Did you hear about that? Um, for writing a memo suggesting that the lack of 50-50 gender proportionality at Google and other tech firms may not be due to bias, but rather to different career predilections on the part of males and females. So Google has this internal thing for um, employees so they can communicate and they can write their views and they can make suggestions and all this kind of stuff. And so he writes up this five-page thing um, uh, writing how it's not because Google is biased, it's because women just don't get drawn to the, to the field of sitting in a cubicle and writing computer code all day. And when they found that, they fired him because he was being sexist. Okay? Um, he cited psychological research establishing that on average, males and females are attracted to different types of work, males to more abstract, idea-centered work, females to more human-centered, rational activities. Uh, Demore was not disparaging the scientific skills of the female engineers working at Google. He was trying to explain why there were not more of them. And I'll say that Demore has a bachelor's degree in biology. And he was just using biological science in what he wrote. Uh, nevertheless, Google accused Demore of using harmful gender stereotypes that put Google's female employees at risk of some unspecified trauma. And she goes on to say, even worse, in January 2018, the National Labor Relations Board released a memo upholding Google's action on the same grounds. Demore had engaged in discrimination and sexual harassment, sexual harassment, by employing harmful gender stereotypes. You know, for, this is about the Me Too movement. And let me just say that um, the Me Too movement, on the one hand, is doing things really necessary and right and true. But then, of course, it's going to take things too far and be really, really destructive. 
the reasons behind the NLRB member, uh, memo put at risk the job of, or the reasoning behind that memo put at risk the job of every academic scientist researching the biological and physiological differences between the sexes. The ideological imperatives of feminism are trumping the search for scientific truth. This is a dangerous position for society to embrace. The Me Too movement, in my view, is kind of like feminism as a whole. Feminism provided some really important and needed correctives. But I think there is a form of toxic feminism, and toxic feminism um, has taken things way too far and, and become destructive. All right, now to Psalm 25. This is the part that we'll concentrate on more, Lord willing, next week. It emphasizes more the truth part. To you, O Yahweh, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. I said that the softer side of God was my favorite side of God. It is until I want God to smite my enemies. And then the other side is pretty cool. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Cause me to know your ways, O Yahweh. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day. And then we get to verse 6 and following. And it says, Remember, O Yahweh, your compassion and your loving kindness. And so we've switched from the truth part to the loving kindness part. For they have been from everlasting. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your loving kindness, remember me. And this is an important line. For your goodness sake. Oh, Yahweh, why should God forgive me? Does God look at me and say, wow, look at Steve. He is so awesome. I think I'll just be forgiving to him. I think in reality, it is for the sake of his own goodness, his own plan, based on his own character, that he picks us out and he says, I will bring you to salvation. I will cause you to know my ways. Good and upright. See those two things again? Good and upright is Yahweh. Therefore, he instructs, that goes with upright, sinners. Why does he even bother with sinners? Because he's good. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. Now back to the truth part. He leads the humble in justice, and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. To those who keep his covenant and decrees. Covenant is a relational thing. Decrees, it's another word for laws. So you can see how the parallel goes between loving kindness and covenant and truth and decrees. And for whom is God both loving, forgiving, and truthful? Those who keep his covenant are faithful in relationship with him and those who follow his laws. For your name's sake, O Yahweh, for your name's sake, pardon my iniquity for it is great. Now, if my sin is great, I know I need a great God to deal with it. And by the way, how do I know my iniquity is great? Do I know my iniquity is great by looking at the softer side of God? Or the just, holy, righteous sight of God. Both really, but where's the starting place? This is is really, really important. I cannot have a healthy relationship with God by starting 
on the softer side of God. I cannot have a healthy relationship with God by starting on the goodness side of God. Now, I know right off you're going to disagree with me on that. But give me some time. If you start on the forgiveness side of God, you cannot end up in a healthy place unless you set that aside, start on the greatness side of God, and relearn everything you thought about the goodness side of God. It's this simple. How can you appreciate the grace of God if you don't have an appreciation for the justice of God? You don't know how deep the grace of God is if you don't know how great your iniquity is. And there might be a problem in American Christianity of American preachers pushing everyone to start at the softer side of God. And when you start at the softer side of God, you cannot end up with a healthy relationship with God unless you unwind that and come back and start at the greatness of God. Carrying on in Psalm 25. Again, the truth part of the psalm. Um, Who is the man who fears Yahweh? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. The intimate counsel of Yahweh is for those who fear him. And he will cause them to know his covenant. Look at the opposite relationship, chiastic relationship, X. Intimate counsel, relational covenant, fear him, he will cause them to know. Um, Again, Jordan Peterson, he interviewed this man, Warren Farrell, on YouTube May uh, 6th this year. So if you want to look at this interview, um, you can look it up on YouTube. Jordan Peterson, heroic. Not a Christian, he says, one of the best things you can do is go to church and act like a Christian. (laughs) Isn't that amazing, right? As far as I know, Warren Farrell is not a Christian. Um, He wrote this book called The Boy Crisis. And what does he say? He he made the most interesting point in this uh, interview, in this video. Children who are only exposed to empathy from their mother tend not to become empathetic. You know this. Take a child, and all he gets is empathetic input. All the child gets is loving kindness, gentleness, forgiveness, nurture, care. You would think that a person treated that way would turn out to be a really great, loving, wonderful person. You would think that a mom who treats their kids that way, in return, and I think this is the thinking of moms sometimes, right? If I just shower my children with love, I'll finally be able to create a human being who loves me. Because moms want to be loved. And they should be loved. But when you shower your child with all the empathy you can muster, what are you creating? Because see, the problem is, you have a fallen child. And when you do that, what do you create? An empathetic child? No, just the opposite. It's amazing, right? This is one of of those uh, mind-blowing truths of life. If you just, if you do nothing but give, 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 give to your kid, you're going to create a spoiled brat. And the kid is not going to love you back. And his argument is what boys need with their mom because you need that, is a dad. See, children exposed to their father and has an authority figure and a disciplinarian tend to become more empathetic. Because with dad, they realize it may not all be about them. And then with mom, they get this wonderful example of empathy. And you put those two things together, and you might end up with an empathetic child. Children need the dads to be less empathetic and caring more about truth and discipline. And when that happens, in that combination, then kids grow up to be more healthy. That's one of the things that feminism wrongly taught us, that 
Women need a man like a fish needs a bicycle. And families don't need fathers. What's the biggest problem we have in our country? It's fatherlessness, isn't it? In this interview, more than half of kids are growing up in a fatherless home in America. How tough is that? And that's why we as a church need to come alongside and provide that role of father figures for kids. Remember, God created us in his image, male and female. Where's the starting place when we come to God? We've got to start with his greatness. Where's the starting place if you want a healthy kid? Well, the starting place with the baby, I mean, you, you see Celeste around with different people. The starting place with the baby is 100% nurture with mom. But let me tell you, you get to a certain age, why do you think there are terrible twos? I mean, it is of necessity, you've got to nurture the baby. But the, the baby's fallen, so by the time the baby's two and can express it, they're the center of the universe. Now, what do you do with that? Right? I mean, by the time they're three or four, you need to make some pretty serious strides at reversing this nurture first. You know, by the time they're teenagers, if you haven't reversed that to discipline first, you've got a problem on your hands. And that's where dad comes in, Right? I mean, the baby's all about mom for the first, I don't know how long, a while. And honestly, dads aren't that interested. Okay, can we just be honest for a minute, right? But when the baby can start to move and, you know, interact a little bit, now dads become pretty interested. And by the time the, the, the kid can throw a ball, we're good to go, right? But that's when we need to kick in. We need to kick in. When we begin to reverse that and say, okay, yeah, we're going to have all kinds of empathy and caring, but discipline first. I mean, this is, I, I've told this to you before, but this is just emblazoned in my mind. This is illustrated so powerfully for me. And once I was in the backyard with one of my kids, I think it happened with both of them. I don't even remember which one I'm thinking of now. But I remember I'm in the backyard with one of the kids and, and I'm between them and the house. And they get hurt and they're crying and they want mom. And I think, well, I think you could have dad. And I'm between them and the house, and they're running for mom, and I'm trying to get to them. They run such a wide circle around me, I can't even catch them until they run into the house and they get mom. And if I ever did catch them, they're screaming the whole time because they don't want me. They want mom. What an awesome connection kids have with their mom. That's how it should be. But they also knew dad was around, right? And I didn't really understand it. We did, I don't think I understood it very well then, but just instinctually, we, we had that thing flip pretty quick. Right? Where discipline first, and if discipline comes first, now you can have happy, nurtured kids. Do you think the kid at the grocery store in the checkout screaming for the candy bar and probably gets it is really a happy kid? I don't think so. And you can tell that kid doesn't have discipline first in their lives. And if you're a single mom, you've got a hard job because you've got to do that. So the categories of attributes of God the Father. God has masculine attributes. Okay, and somebody's going to say, well, it's not that simple. I know it's not that simple. God's not that simple. People aren't that simple. Right? Um, but there are things that are basically masculine attributes. There are things that are basically feminine attributes. And I ask the question, why does God reveal himself as Father? when he has both attributes? Well, I'll uh, maybe hopefully give you that answer next week. All right. I want to just marinate in these four verses. These four verses are so awesome. And really, these verses are meaningful if you have come to these verses through the greatness of God. If you've come to these loving kindness verses. Uh, my Hebrew professor, Ron Allen, Translated that word, loyal love, chesed, loyal love. The loyal love of God, like the loyal love of a mom to her babies. If you've come to this through the greatness of God, these verses have such deep meaning. Don't they? My eyes are continually toward Yahweh, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. 
You're wrapped up and you didn't see it coming. And he will untangle you. Turn to me. Be gracious to me. For I am lonely and afflicted. I studied these verses in tears this week. Be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. You ever feel pressured? We need the loving kindness of God. Look upon my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. A mother's love is patient and forgiving when all others are forsaking. It never fails or falters even though the heart is breaking. I'm pretty sure the person who wrote that didn't know you could switch out God and mother right there. God's love is patient and forgiving when all others are forsaking. It never fails or falters even though the heart is breaking. I saw a sign on a church, I think, in Tigard, and it says, said something like, there's no better expression of God's love than a mom's love. I went, yeah, that's what I'm preaching Sunday. That's it, isn't it? There's no better expression of God's love than a mother's love. And then you get to the rest of the psalm, and it's in the truth part. We'll take a look at that, Lord willing, next week. Read it in between. But here's the takeaway. Moms practically reveal the softer side of God. Isn't that awesome? And that's our favorite side of God. And we see that in moms. How about this? You don't know something? Google it. You don't know someone? Facebook it. You can't find something? Mom. (laughs) Which leads to this truth. Nothing is really lost until your mom can't find it. (laughs) Isn't that true? And you could switch the word, nothing is really lost until your wife can't find it. No frustration in our family there. Here's a good one. If I manage to survive the rest of the week, I would like my straight jacket in hot pink and my helmet to sparkle. (laughs) So application. There is a wonderful and healthy balance achieved by a mom who is distinctly feminine, but not exclusively feminine. Right? Right? As as human beings, we kind of are both male and female. I mean, I don't mean that in a crazy way we have it today. But men have feminine qualities and women have masculine qualities. But on average, a woman should have much stronger feminine qualities. Grace and truth. There's a wonderful and healthy balance achieved by a mom who's distinctly feminine but not exclusively feminine. And the opposite is true with men. And children desperately need both in their lives. The feminine and the masculine. So first of all, moms balance grace and truth like all of us. It's just that I think moms find it easier to lead with grace. Because moms are naturally great at grace, empathy, loving kindness, and nurturing. And so we really need what moms bring to their half of the parenting adventure. We do. Our children need it. I don't know. I need some nurturing from my wife, and I get it. Conclusion, women are awesome. Because women show us our favorite part of God. Probably the most famous 
mother in my lifetime who never had kids is Mother Teresa. There's some great wisdom from her. The greatest disease in the West today is not TB or leprosy. It is being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. Isn't that amazing? We can cure physical diseases with medicine, but the only cure for loneliness, despair, and hopelessness is love. There are many in the world who are dying for a piece of bread, but there are many more dying for a little love. We need mom. The poverty in the West is a different kind of poverty. It is not only a poverty of loneliness, but also of spirituality. We need mom. Let no one ever come to you without leaving better and happier. Be the living expression of God's kindness. I should have just read that, and that could have been the sermon, right? Kindness in your face, kindness in your eyes, kindness in your smile. What can you do to promote world peace? I like this. Go home and love your family. (laughs) That's where it starts, doesn't it? Where does charity begin? Hmm. Moms practically reveal the softer side of God. So, now, let's turn the tables today and regularly and show the women in our lives some extra loving kindness. Repay that. We can do that, can't we, men? Remember Red Green's show? And their lodge had the, they would all say together, I'm a man, and I can change. If I have to, I guess. (laughs) I'm a man, and I can show my wife or my mom a little love today. If I have to, I guess. (laughs) Well, it shouldn't really be like that, should it? We should be glad and quite able to love and cherish the women in our lives. Amen? Let's pray together.